gentle folk of the internet, and welcome to the tabletop watering hole I like to call Myth Brigade. My name is Jason. I'm your host or GM or a keeper, a whole lot of other things here on the channel. And I'm back to wearing this damn cowboy hat. Now for the next spell, we're going to be continuing our lessons on Savage Worlds Adventure Edition from them damn geniuses over at Pinnacle Entertainment. If you're new to this series, you may want to backtrack a couple episodes and get caught up with the fast, furious rules we've covered so far. I know it's been a while, and I know many of you have missed us. Hell, you might even be one of them folks that said nice things like, What's Smith Brigade waiting for? The rest of his hair to turn gray? And then, Rules bites. More like slacker slices? You <laughs> dead bro? <laughs> Don't forget. Hello? Is this Jason from Myth Brigade? Yeah, yeah. You lazy piece of shit! <laughs> All right, you've got me. It's been a minute. But we're back, and today we're going to be exploring the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition rules that govern things like magical powers, psychic powers, superpowers, weird science powers, and pretty much anything one might rightly call... Um... Powers. Now, some game systems approach these elements with a discrete set of rules and a $40 source book per subject. This can be pretty cool for rules geeks and collectors, but it brings a ton of overhead and complexity to the table, and that can lead to some pretty cringeworthy moments during play. In keeping with its commitment to speed and simplicity, the Savage World system manages to wrap all of its powers into a single, easy to grasp system whose mechanics remain more or less the same, whether you're playing a gray wizard from the Tower of Aragoth, a galactic navigator steering through the perils of hyperspace, or a sea witch channeling the powers of the ocean through a special black pearl. The root of the power system is the arcane background edge. This basically defines a reason your character has powers and sets some important parameters around which skill you develop and use for your powers, the number of actual powers you start with, and the number of power points you will have to spend during play. Don't spend them all in one place. <laughs> Each savage setting will have its own arcane backgrounds, like the Huckster in Deadlands. This allows the GM to fold in some texture from the world and the overall story and set the overall powerfulness according to the level of magic in the campaign. The core rules offer a few starter backgrounds that represent general themes that you'll find in most game worlds. The first arcane background we'll discuss is Gifted. Now, Gifted describes a character whose powers are innate. So think of an alien with acid glands that can spit globs of corrosive goo at its foes. To test powers with a Gifted background, you'll use the arcane skill Focus, which is based on spirit. You'll start with a single power, Bolt in this case, and have 15 power points to use during play. Next up is magic. Now, these characters use ancient gestures and incantations to channel supernatural energy into spectacular effect. This is pretty much your traditional mage, sorcerer, conjurer, necromancer, Gandalf, Raceland, and Merlin sort of thing. You'll buy and develop a skill called spellcasting, which is based on smarts. You'll start out with three powers, or spells, and ten power points to use during play. I beg you. Give your humble servant the power to heal the sick. And to get an extra Benny any time I roll a three. The Miracles background is powered by divine energy from gods, spirits, nature, or something equally as spirity. Miracle-based powers are invoked using the faith skill, which is based on spirit. Characters with the Miracles background could be clerics, shaman, monks, or a pastor from the hollers. The point is, the power is coming from that divine place, and not so much the character directly. Characters with this background start with three powers and ten power points to spend during play. 
Oh, what's the matter? You don't like me in your head? <laughs> Wait till you feel this. The psionics background describes a character whose abilities are powered by the mind. These characters use mental energy to manipulate the physical world around them. Now, this could mean reading minds or predicting the future, bending spoons, moving objects, maybe even making a bad guy's head pop. Some examples might be Star Trek's Counselor Troy, Professor Xavier, the bad guys on scanners, or maybe even David Blaine. I know it's a stretch, or is it? Let me know in the comments below. You'll develop a skill called psionics to control your psychic abilities. You'll start with three powers and 10 power points to use during play. The elixir is ready. Now to anoint my underpants. Finally, the core rules give us the weird science background, which is one of the most complicated, but one of the coolest one of all. These characters use crazy inventions to push science beyond what common folk will consider normal. Their devices could be fueled by odd substances like Deadlands Ghost Rock or Hellsphere's Infernium. They could channel some alien energy from the cosmos using a strange resonant frequency, like something out of Lovecraft. The Weird Science background is driven by the smarts-based Weird Science skill. It grants two starting powers and 15 power points to use during play. Now, GMs, keep in mind, this background requires that the character have access to the device associated with his or her power. So without that Ghost Rock-powered pimp cane, Ezra might think better of charging into the fray. Now, the rules do allow for the concept of something called jury rig, or the improvisation of a power if a device is not present. But I would caution GMs against allowing this too willingly. At minimum, there should be a negative two penalty and a whole lot of explanation required to pull it off. So maybe old Ezra knows enough about his pimp cane to get a similar but less powerful effect out of a desk lamp, a potato battery, and a coat hanger. Other characters may not use a given character's weird science contraptions. Attempts to do so should prove too complex or reveal some calibration that would be needed to produce any real effect. The one exception I see here might be a second character who also has a weird science background. Maybe they could give it a go with a slightly lesser penalty. Also, for the normal characters, let them try. I mean, what could go wrong? As an offset for the hardware dependency, Weird Science characters can actually create devices for other characters to use. This is possible for seasoned characters with the Artificer Edge, which allows them to fabricate arcane devices. Now, the specifics around this are a little involved for this episode, but check out page 153 for the specifics when your characters are ready to start tinkering. One last note, though the power system covers most of the otherworldly abilities characters may have, there is a gap. Full-on four-color superheroes like Superman, the Hulk, Fantastic Four, or Spawn push the mechanics a little far. Punisher? Doctor Strange? Maybe. But for the other stuff, you'll want to pick up the Savage World's Superpowers Companion, which Myth Brigade is proud to have helped kickstart. Now, this expansion introduces some great rules for creation of superheroes, supervillains, secret fortresses, and for running various styles of high-powered superhero campaigns. Now that we're clear on arcane backgrounds, let's dive a little deeper into powers themselves. The first up is trappings. Now, trappings describes the physical incarnation of a power. They're essentially thematic modifiers that allow core powers to be tailored to have different appearances, sounds, or smells, all while remaining mostly the same in terms of game mechanics. For example, the bolt power on page 156 could be a firebolt, an electrical pulse, a shard of ice, an acidic spit from our alien friend, or anything else that conforms to the idea of a single projectile attack. Using this concept, settings will actually introduce unique spins on the core powers, or, if you're brave, you can even try to create your own. And now, I shall cast upon thee, shit missile. Sometimes, trapping can introduce the potential for something called synergy. 
that causes a bonus or a penalty in certain situations. So let's assume our hero is attacking with an electricity-based power. Enemies wading in the water should probably take plus two to damage. Conversely, a sound-based power used in an anechoic chamber A final note around trappings is the concept of limitations. Limitations allow a player to set permanent restrictions to a power's function upon purchasing that power. This makes it less difficult to manifest at the expense of versatility. Limitations can be made to range, such as turning a missile attack into a touch attack, or aspect. Aspect limitations are applied to powers that allow a caster to choose an effect when casting. An example might be the growth and shrink power, which during play allows you to do either one of those things on a single target. Here, you could use limitations to reduce the casting cost by deciding that that power will only ever apply to growth. Each limitation placed on a power reduces the cost to manifest that power by one. So now we know what powers are, let's talk about how to use them. All powers are activated using the appropriate arcane skill for the character's arcane background. So if necessary, a target within range is selected and then a skill roll is made. Any situational bonuses or penalties are factored in to get a total. And as with any other skill check in Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, if the modified total is a four or more, the character burns all the power points for that casting and the effect is produced successfully. So basically they cast their power. The GM then sorts out the impact or the effect on the target or situation. In many cases, it's pretty much that simple. Note that a success with a raise typically introduces additional effects, and you'll find those listed with each power's description if applicable. Failure to activate a power comes in two flavors. The standard failure, or a modified skill roll of less than four, means the power just doesn't work. The GM should probably add a little flavor to this, or even let the player do so, but the bottom line is it just kind of fizzles out. In these scenarios, the caster spends a single power point to represent the failed effort and the action is then concluded. Now, there are edges that can affect power point cost during play, but in general, the cost of this kind of failure should never be lower than one. Critical failure, or an unmodified roll of snake eyes, results in something called backlash. Now, while backlash doesn't cause any physical damage to the caster, it does introduce a level of fatigue and any currently active powers are suddenly interrupted. It's like they lose touch with their power entirely. This also concludes the player's action. Now, while it may seem like common sense, in order to attempt activation, the character must be able to see the target, which must also be in range. He or she can't be shaken, bound, or in any other state that would prohibit the necessary gestures, incantations, or other aspect of the casting. Powers with duration can be maintained by spending an additional power point before that duration expires. So let's say old Archer has cast Vicious Stink here in the studio, which we know lasts five rounds. All he has to do to continue that stench is spend a power point during his action on that fifth round. This renews the effect on a single target for the power's normal duration. So another five rounds in the case of Archer's Stink. Maintaining a power on multiple targets costs another power point per target. So you can see how this sort of adds up if you're maintaining a lot of buffs or debuffs on a crowd of people. Characters that have run out of power points are simply unable to use their powers without something called shorting, which we'll talk about in a moment. Points can be recharged through rest, meditation, communion with the character's deity, or a similar activity that's appropriate for the arcane background. Points return at a rate of five per hour, during this time, characters really can't exert themselves, maintain powers, or perform any complex actions. I'd also recommend tailoring the recharge to the number of points the character spent and over what time. So if the character wore down half his or her points over a series of mild encounters, let them return as specified or maybe even a little faster. If they were burnt down to zero in a single harrowing battle, maybe cut that recharge in half to represent the exhaustion. 
You shouldn't cripple the character, but it's a really good opportunity to work in some texture. Like any other action, activation can be used as an entire chain or as part of a chain in multi-action, as seen on page 103. This is helpful when buffing oneself or companions at the beginning of an encounter, or maybe in a last ditch attempt to survive with a flurry of spells against the big baddie. Up to three powers can be activated this way, but a negative two penalty is assessed to all activations when attempting two, and a whopping negative four when attempting three. Not to mention the mounting PowerPoint costs of all those failures. My last note for you on activations is one of my absolute favorite aspects of the system, and that's shorting. With shorting, a character can attempt to activate a power for less power points than it normally costs, or even none at all. For each point shorted, a negative one penalty is assessed to the arcane skill check. So, for example, attempting to heal at a zero cost when it usually costs three would be a whopping negative three penalty to the activation check, along with any other modifiers that are going on. Success means the activation works as usual and less points, or in this case, no points are spent to get there. But there's a catch. Any failure at all when shorting like this is automatically considered to be a critical one. All right, so we know power points are used to activate powers in the moment, but they can also be used to augment a power's effects with a concept called power modifiers. By purchasing power modifiers at the moment of casting, a player can add effects like armor piercing, long range, lingering damage, and others for the duration of that casting. There's a standard list of these modifiers on page 152 of the core rules, and it outlines those that apply to most powers, along with the PowerPoint cost for each. Individual power descriptions on page 154 through 171 provide additional options unique to each power. So, if you've got the points, you can actually stack these to supercharge a single casting with incredible effects. And that, my friends, is how powers work. The last thing you need to know here is how to navigate the powers list on pages 154 through 171. Now, this is pretty straightforward, but I figured I'd cover the headings just in case. So first up, we've got rank, which denotes the rank your character must be before you can purchase the power, no exceptions. Next, the power points you need to cast the power without any modifying edges or shorting attempts. We then have range, which, if you just take a glance, isn't exactly that straightforward. Often there's going to be the name of an attribute, usually smarts or some multiple of it. This should be best thought of as up to the smarts die in inches on the tabletop. So a 1d10 in smarts means up to 10 inches on the table. d6, up to 6 inches on the table. Range is only used for casting, though I would argue one might want to consider it when renewing a power's duration. Which brings us to duration. Generally expressed in rounds, duration tells us how long a power lasts. Powers expire at the end of the character's turn on that final round, giving them the opportunity to extend it or maintain it by spending that power point, as we discussed earlier. Casters can end powers at any time within the duration, but not in part. So if a power is in effect for multiple targets, it has to be ended for all or none. Now finally, we have some suggestions for how the power might manifest under the trappings header. Players are free to use these as they are, tweak them a little bit, or go all out and create your very own. You know, as we saw with... Shit missile. All right, there you have it. Our long, long overdue deep dive into what I think is one of the most incredible magic and power systems in print today. As always, thank you for joining us and for all you do to support the channel. Please throw us a Benny in our quest against the algorithmic overlords and click the like button below. If you're not subscribed, please click that button too. It goes a long way toward keeping this channel in growth mode. Make sure to check out our live streams on Twitch TV slash Myth Brigade and stay tuned for a lot more RPG goodness right here. In the meantime, though, kind of curious as to what Undead Cowboy has gotten itself up to. Don't go digging for water. Under now, house.